Well, Jay's treaty, as I pointed out in the last lecture, was pivotal in the formation of national political parties. It also had numerous additional consequences. A major treaty with Spain, Washington's farewell address, an undeclared war with France, and a near civil war by decades end. In this lecture, we will explore each of these consequences individually. Let's turn first to the treaty with Spain. At the same time that John Jay was sent to London, Thomas Pinckney was sent to Spain to obtain free navigation of the Mississippi River, the right of deposit at New Orleans, and the 31st degree north latitude as the boundary between US territory and Spanish Florida. Pinckney's ship was fortuitously delayed, and by the time he arrived, news of Jay's treaty had leaked out, but not the specific contents. The Spanish believed, incorrectly, that it was a formal Anglo-American alliance. This they greatly feared. They were in alliance with Britain against France, but they were about to leave that alliance. And what the Spanish feared was an Anglo-American combined military action against their New World colonies. Spain, being weak, felt it could not stop such an Anglo-American assault. It was therefore time to mend fences with the United States in order to prevent such an attack from taking place. The result will be the Treaty of San Lorenzo, also known as Pinckney's Treaty in which Spain essentially agreed to everything the United States wanted. Free navigation of the Mississippi River, the right of deposit at New Orleans, and the 31st degree north latitude as the boundary between Spanish Florida and the United States. Now the French also concluded incorrectly that Jay's treaty was a formal alliance between the United States and Great Britain. But unlike Spain, the French are strong. They feel betrayed. They feel that Jay's treaty contradicts the treaty of alliance that the United States still had with France, that Americans have turned on them, and they respond by seizing American ships and suspending diplomatic relations with the United States. At the same time that this is happening, Washington decides he will not seek a third term as president in 1796, and he decides to announce this fact within a farewell address to the American people. The resulting document was destined to become one of the most famous in all of US history, but it is a document shrouded in myth and misunderstanding. First and foremost, it is not a statement of isolationism. It never mentions the word isolationism. It never mentions the words no entangling alliances, and it never deals with that concept. Furthermore, the farewell address is not even a publicly delivered address. All it is, is a document printed in a Philadelphia newspaper. And Washington was not its sole author. Indeed, the first draft had been written by James Madison for Washington in 1792, when Washington first thought of retiring, and the famous foreign policy sections were co-authored by Washington and Alexander Hamilton in 1796. Well, if our understanding of the farewell address is to be accurate, what does it actually say? Of course, the key message that Washington wishes to make clear is that he will not run again. We tend to skip over this. This was utterly critical for the future of this country. Washington could have had as many terms as he wanted. This denial of power, not for the first time, but this denial of power, this willingness to give up power was critical. It established a two-term precedent for the presidency that would not be broken until Franklin Roosevelt ran for a third term in 1940. 
And then in the 1950s, the Congress would pass an amendment and the states would pass an amendment, making sure that Franklin Roosevelt was the only president ever to serve more than two terms. Presidents are now constitutionally limited to two terms. That was not the case in 1796. But beyond that, Washington wished to warn his fellow citizens of certain dangers based on his experiences. His basic theme, the dangers of political parties, especially when based on geography. Such parties, he warned, would threaten liberty, would lead to constant agitation, and would, quote, open the door to foreign influence and corruption, and thus a loss of independence, as different parties would side with different foreign powers, giving those foreign powers influence within the country. Washington also told his countrymen to, quote, observe good faith and justice toward all nations, cultivate peace and harmony with all, but avoid at all costs what he referred to as inveterate antipathies against particular nations and passionate attachments for others. In other words, avoid emotionalism in foreign affairs. The nation which indulges toward another an habitual hatred or an habitual fondness is in some degree a slave. He also added, there is no greater error than to expect or calculate upon real favors from nation to nation. It is an illusion. The great rule for the United States, Washington continued, was to have as little political connection as possible with others while extending commercial relations with other nations. European interests, he argued, were different from American interests and geography enabled the United States to pursue such a course. If it did, the United States would be able to remain at peace and to build up its strength to a point where it could defy the great powers of Europe. Washington also added that the nation should avoid permanent alliances, that they were not in the national interest, though temporary alliances were acceptable for extraordinary circumstances. Now, Washington had actually voiced many of these ideas previously. Let me give you just one example. In December of 1795, he had written to Gouverneur Morris, quote, my policy has been and will continue to be to be on friendly terms with, but independent of all nations of the earth, to share in the broils of none, to fulfill our own engagements, to supply the wants and be the carriers for them all, being thoroughly convinced that it is our policy and interest to do so, and that nothing short of self-respect and that justice which is essential to a national character ought to involve us in war. For sure I am. If this country is preserved in tranquility for 20 years longer, it may bid defiance in a just cause to any power whatsoever, such in that time will be its population, its wealth, and its resource. But in the context of 1796, Washington's farewell address was clearly designed to be a public defense of his policies as well, most notably a defense of Jay's treaty for which he was being savagely attacked at that point, but also a defense of his policies in regard to the Genet Affair and in regard to Pinckney's treaty. Implicitly then, it is an attack upon his critics who he considered to be pro-French and without good reason to be pro-French. Since 1796 was also a presidential election year, and since political parties had formed, and you had two candidates for president, John Adams for the Federalists, who was at that point vice president, and Thomas Jefferson for the Democratic Republicans, Washington's farewell address can also be viewed as a partisan political document geared to the 1796 election and geared to getting John Adams elected president. Simultaneously, it is a warning by a foreign policy realist, and Washington is a foreign policy realist against partisanship 
and emotionalism in foreign policy. And he provides a blueprint for achieving independence from Europe and empire in the new world. For future generations, however, the address would be interpreted quite differently, as we shall see. As if to fulfill Washington's warning, the French minister to the United States encouraged people to vote for Jefferson against Adams in the 1796 presidential election. And when Adams won, the French government authorized the seizure of any U.S. vessel carrying British goods, and it refused to receive the new U.S. minister that Washington had sent to Paris. John Adams, when he is inaugurated president in March of 1797, thus inherits a diplomatic crisis. Like Washington, Adams seeks to avoid war. Washington had sent John Jay to London to avoid war. Adams now sends envoys to Paris in an effort to obtain a virtual Jay Treaty with the French. But the French foreign minister, Charles Maurice Talleyrand, refuses to even see the three envoys. And as they are about to leave, Talleyrand's representatives visit them and demand a bribe and a loan to open talks with the French government. We have here the notorious XYZ affair, XYZ being the letters to refer to the French agents. Again, contrary to mythology, uh, the bribe was insulting but it was not what killed the talks. It was the loan, because the loan would have ended the neutrality of the United States. But when the bribe became known in the United States, it led to a public uproar and an undeclared naval war known as the Quasi War with the French on the high seas. The XYZ affair, also resulted in passage of four notorious acts known as the Alien and the Sedition Acts, directed against both immigrants and the Republican Party press. Immigrants and a party press, which the Federalist majority labeled as treasonous. What you have emerging here are two factors. One, what is known as nativism a hatred and fear of immigrants, even though this is a nation of Im immigrants, and an attempt to repress the opposition press before the election of 1800. What did these acts do? One act extended the naturalization period to 14 years, meaning uh, that recent immigrants who would vote Jeffersonian would not be able to vote. Two of the laws gave the president the power to imprison or deport suspected aliens in time of war or in time of peace. And the Sedition Act outlawed any statements against the government that were false, malicious, or scandalous. 25 people would be arrested under this law. Every one of them was a Democratic Republican newspaper editor. One of the most notorious cases, Matthew Lyon, who was also a congressional representative from Vermont. He is jailed and his constituents reelect him to Congress from jail. The Federalist Congress also passes bills to create a large army. Now, to have a Navy to fight the French in a naval war makes sense. Why have a large army? Of what possible use could such an army be? Two possible uses. If this undeclared naval war with France expands into a full-scale war, the United States, high federalist hope, would align itself with Britain and attack French and Spanish possessions in the New World. But the Democratic Republicans fear there is another goal here. And for certain high federalists, it may very well have been a second goal to use this new army to forcibly suppress the Republican opposition. You do not yet have a concept of a truly loyal opposition within this country. 
the Federalists view the Republicans as traitors, tools of France, whereas the Republicans view the Federalists as traitors, tools of England. In this situation, Jefferson and Madison responded to what they perceived to be a direct threat to civil liberties with the Virginia and Kentucky resolutions asserting the right of an individual state to nullify a federal law that it considered unconstitutional. There was no effort made to go to the Supreme Court since that was dominated by the Federalists. And indeed, Supreme Court justices were enforcing the Alien and the Sedition Acts. You have here the origins of what will become the Southern doctrine of nullification leading up to the Civil War in 1861. But what we see is that the United States is teetering on the verge of civil war in the 1790s, combined with full-scale war against France. Neither took place. There was no civil war at this time. There was no full-scale war against France. Why? Primarily, it is due to the political courage of John Adams, one of the least known of the founding fathers. Washington, Jefferson, Madison, Adams often gets buried, but his political courage at this point is extraordinary. What took place here? Stunned by the American reaction and facing new problems as a result of a major naval defeat to the British in late 1798, the French government repealed its decrees against U.S. shipping, while Talleyrand made clear his desire for new American envoys, an end to the quasi-war, and a peace treaty. President Adams responded positively. He did not want to lead a weak and divided country into war. And in addition to that, Adams loathed and feared Alexander Hamilton who would lead the new army and supported by other high federalists might run rampant in the country. Adams therefore refused to ask Congress for a formal declaration of war. He refused to fill the ranks of the new army that Hamilton was going to lead. Instead, he decided to send a new commission to France. In an extraordinary series of events, his Secretary of State, Timothy Pickering, a supporter of Alexander Hamilton, tried to block him and indeed delayed sending the envoys. Adams discovered this, asked for Pickering's res resignation. When he could not get it, he fired Pickering as well as other Hamilton supporters within his cabinet. The envoys arrived in France to discover that Napoleon had by that point taken power and Napoleon was quite willing to make peace, though not on as favorable terms as the previous French government had been willing to. Terms were reached. The Convention of Mortefontaine or the Convention of 1800 was signed and ended both the quasi-war between the United States and France and the French alliance of 1778. The American envoys had originally desired French payment for claims by American citizens for the seizure of their ships. Napoleon said he would not pay. The American government assumed those claims. Napoleon in turn agreed to end the alliance of 1778 and the quasi-war ended. Adams thus prevented full-scale war with France, and one might argue he also prevented a civil war. But his behavior created a formal split within the Federalist Party. Hamilton, infuriated by Adams' behavior, now publicly denounced the president. The Federalist Party split right before the election of 1800, and that played a role in Thomas Jefferson's ensuing victory over John Adams in the presidential election of 1800. 
There was one kicker, however. The Constitution, as I previously mentioned, did not allow for political parties. Every, you had not a separate vote for president and vice president, but simple tallying of electoral votes. The highest number of votes became president. The second highest number of votes became vice presidents. Well, in the election of 1796, that meant that the president and vice president came from different political parties. In the election of 1800, party discipline held and every Democratic Republican elector wound up casting one vote for Thomas Jefferson and one for his vice presidential nominee, Aaron Burr. The result was a tie. A tie is to be decided in the United States Congress with each state casting one vote. Uh, many Federalists, it is a Federalist dominated Congress, so the Federalists will have to choose which Republican becomes president. And many of them, believing their own rhetoric about Thomas Jefferson, figured they would vote for Burr. Burr was a scoundrel, they thought, who they could work with. Jefferson, they feared as an ideologue. They, many of them believed that he was the Antichrist. Hamilton and others uh, argued against this. They argued that Burr was dangerous and that Jefferson should be the one chosen as president. And in the end, Jefferson was. This will play a role in the next lecture, as we will see in the conspiracy of Aaron Burr that took place during Jefferson's second term. But getting back now to John Adams, what Adams had done was an extraordinary act of political courage. It was an act of political courage that ended his own political career. And he knew it. I will defend my missions to France, he wrote, as long as I have an eye to direct my hand or a finger to hold my pen. They are the most disinterested and meritorious actions of my life. I reflect upon them with so much satisfaction that I desire no other inscription over my gravestone than here lies John Adams, who took upon himself the responsibility of the peace with France in the year 1800. Adams, I would argue, is the unsung hero of his generation for this self-sacrifice. Self-sacrifice was deeply embedded within his political philosophy. Something that I think is most clearly expressed in a letter he wrote to his wife, Abigail, when she asked him, why do you constantly deal with politics? You don't really like it. He responded as follows. I must study politics and war that my sons may have the liberty to study mathematics and philosophy, navigation, commerce, and agriculture in order to give their children a right to study painting, poetry, music, and porcelain. With Adam's defeat in 1800, came the defeat of the Federalist Party, both for the presidential election and in Congress. The Federalist Party would never again control the presidency or Congress. It would become a minority opposition party and it would totally disappear within two decades. But the Federalist Party was of critical importance to American survival during the 1790s and I would argue, to America's eventual rise to world dominance. It was the Federalists who made the new national government under the Constitution viable. We tend to assume today that of course this new government was going to work. There was no such guarantee in this regard in 1789. The Federalists are responsible for that. Under Washington and Adams, the Federalists also prevented involvement by a weak nation in a European war that could have destroyed the country. It could have destroyed the country externally, and as we have seen, it could have destroyed the country internally. In the process of doing this, the Federalists established the basic principles of American diplomacy for the duration of that century, the next century, and through up to the present day. Equally important and closely related, the Federalists established a realist perspective 
for the future conduct of American foreign relations, best summed up in Washington's farewell address and his warnings against emotional attachments and emotional antipathies towards other nations. One major remaining question. Why did the military dictator Napoleon Bonaparte, now ruling France, agree to the Convention of 1800, the Convention of Mort de Fontaine? He is not exactly a peace-loving man. Napoleon, however, needed peace with the United States. For at this point in time, he had decided to recreate the French Empire in the New World. He, at the same time that he is signing this peace treaty with the Americans, is signing an armistice with the British and arranging for the transfer of Louisiana from Spain back to France. All of these events, as we are going to see in the next lecture, are linked. In planning this, however, I think Napoleon would have been wise to read the warning of the French minister to the United States, Pierre Hadet, four years earlier, in 1796. The Federalists had been attacking Jefferson as a tool of France, cutting through this propaganda, this paranoia, these popular stereotypes. Hadet wrote home an assessment of Thomas Jefferson in the following words, quote, Mr. Jefferson loves us because he detests England. He seeks rapprochement with us because he distrusts us less than Great Britain. But he would change perhaps tomorrow from a sentiment favorable to us if tomorrow Great Britain should cease to inspire him with fears. Although Jefferson is the friend of liberty and science, although he is an admirer of the efforts we have made to cast off our shackles and to clear away the cloud of ignorance which weighs down the human race, Jefferson, I say, is an American. And as such, he cannot sincerely be our friend. An American is the born enemy of all the peoples of Europe. These words, as Napoleon was about to learn, were prophetic. For when Jefferson heard of Spain's retrocession of Louisiana and New Orleans to France, he would propose that the United States marry itself to the British fleet, and if necessary, make war on the country that he had previously befriended. Jefferson was indeed an American. And perhaps it was indeed true that an American was the born enemy, at least in that time, of all the peoples of Europe.